Good afternoon, everybody. Go ahead and call the Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure to order. Will the secretary call the roll? Sorry, Ms. Peters. Senator Hammond? Here. Senator Hansen? Here. Senator Pizzina? Present. Senator Spearman? Chair Harris? Here, uh, please mark uh, Senator Spearman present when she arrives. We have four members, so we have quorum. We're just going to jump right into it. We'll start with the first bill on the agenda. That's Senate Bill 447, which authorizes the use of testing devices to determine the presence of a controlled substance or prohibited substance in the oral fluid of a person in certain circumstances. Welcome. Uh, go ahead and start whenever you are ready. Thank you. I'm going to just organize myself for just a moment. Thank you. That's okay, Ms. Davey. Take your time. Uh, in the meantime, committee members on your desk, you should have a proposed amendment. Um, it's several pages long, so I, I think we might be working off of this one. We're going to walk through the amendment as well, so thank you. Um, Good afternoon, uh, Chair and members of the Committee of uh, Growth and Infrastructure. I'm Amy Davey. I'm the Director of the Nevada Office of Traffic Safety, which is within the Department of Public Safety. I'm joined today at the table by Captain Eddie Bowers of the Nevada State Police Highway Patrol, uh, Stephen Johnson, who is the Director of the Washoe County Forensic Science Division and a board member of the Committee on Testing for Intoxication, and Dr. David Astles, also with the Washoe County Forensic Science Division. We're here to talk to you about SB447 and oral fluid preliminary DUI testing. SB447 authorizes use of oral fluid testing devices as an aid in DUI determination. <clears throat> this is a companion bill to AB239, sponsored by the Sunset Subcommittee of the Legislative Commission, which adds certain duties to the Committee on Testing for Intoxication. SB 447, however, as a critical component which authorizes law enforcement officers to consider oral fluid testing when making preliminary DUI evaluations. Impaired driving continues to be a significant safety concern on our roadways. We know that 55% of fatal crashes include a substance, um, uh, is, it, are substance involved, and we know that up to 87% of wrong way fatal um, driving crashes include substance impairment. Uh, we have a thorough presentation for you. We also have some proposed amendments to this bill that we'll present to you this afternoon as well. I'm now gonna turn over the presentation to Captain Eddie Bowers to talk about the technology and use of oral fluid testing, followed by Stephen Johnson and Dr. David Astles to give you further details about the uh, testing technology itself. We just um, had some questions uh, prior to coming in here about the validity of the testing, which Dr. Um, Astles will be able to provide. And, um, and then also we'll walk you through the proposed amendments to the bill. Um, go ahead, Captain Bowers. Thank you, uh, Captain Eddie Bowers, Nevada Highway Patrol, for the record. Uh, first off, thank you very much uh, to the committee for hearing this legislation. Um, many of you know preliminary breath testing devices have been used for many years to help officers confirm or dispel the presence of alcohol when it, as it relates to an impaired driving offense. Um, a device like this has typically been used at the end of a very thorough uh, investigation completed by a police officer made up of looking at a number of factors. One, a vehicle's driving behavior, um, the way a driver presents when contacted by a police officer on a traffic stop or on the scene of a crash, uh, and then finally, uh, after completion of field sobriety testing in the field, uh, the subject's then given the test to determine whether or not they have alcohol in their system. Now there's no such thing, or for many years there hasn't been such a thing to help aid in discerning whether or not somebody has uh, drugs in their system. Uh, up until recently, officers were provided very extensive training if they chose to participate in this training uh, to become a drug recognition expert. This training is very complex. It takes two weeks. Officers are taught um, many things about drug categories, the effects that these drugs have on the human body. Um, but the reality is this training is very complex and you can't even attend it until you have more than two years of experience uh, as a police officer. Um, 
At present, the academy, the post approved academy provides advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement training that is just a little added something extra for officers, some added tests for them to perform to help um, figure out whether or not somebody driving may be impaired uh, with drugs. But again, it's not as useful, it's, it's a piece, it's a piece to a larger puzzle, but oral fluid now has been used widely throughout the country since 2009. Um, this is similar to a PBT in that it is done at the roadside, it's preliminary, it's not evidential in nature, and it just is some extra piece of evidence to help an officer reach a correct arrest decision. It's non-intrusive, um, just like a preliminary breath test for alcohol. Um, somebody blows into a straw on the side of the highway with an oral fluid sample. Uh, the officer tears open a new swab, gives that to a driver, and it is the driver that swabs their own mouth. They return that to the officer. This is then inserted into a device that tests the sample provided. It usually takes, depending on the uh, type of device you're using, it takes anywhere from five to eight minutes uh, to reveal either a positive or negative result for as many as six to seven different types of drugs. Um, the device that we have used previously um, tests for amphetamines, methamphetamines, benzodiazepines, cannabis, uh, cocaine, and opiates. Um, each one of these test cassettes have cutoff limits. Uh, you're all familiar with the illegal per se portion in the law that says if you're a .08 or higher, that is just illegal in and of itself. Uh, the same could be said for like methamphetamines. If somebody tests with 100 nanograms or more of methamphetamine in their system, that's considered illegal in and of itself. Well, these test cassettes, some of them have varied cutoff limits. Um, one of the devices we've been using for methamphetamine, as an example, has a cutoff limit of 50 nanograms, meaning if somebody driving a car uh, is tested and they have under 50 nanograms in their system, the device would read that as negative. Uh, but conversely, if they had more than that, they may read as positive. Now, with the per se amount being 100 nanograms for uh, an impaired driving offense in our state, that's a positive reading on that roadside test. That's not an evidentiary test. That's just one extra piece. Like with alcohol, consider you can be below a .08, but yet still be impaired to render you incapable of operating motor vehicles. So two different theories under which that might be prosecuted. But the cutoff limits are different. It just depends on the manufacturer. It depends on the test cassette you're using. My colleagues here will be able to speak to the science of that, um, and that's why their involvement with this committee on intoxication is so important to approve the devices and the cassettes that are used to make sure that we're selecting devices that are scientifically reliable. Um, so in conclusion, I'll just tell you with um, the issues plaguing departments across the state with recruitment and retention. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that in the state now, the state, I tell you, there are approximately a little more than 80 drug recognition experts in the entire state. That's not just the state police highway patrol. That's every police agency, only 80. I would submit to you that's not enough. So this is just an added piece. If we can get trusted, reliable equipment into the field in officers' hands, this is something extra to help them develop frames of reference, people that they come into contact with, to grow their experience level. Um, again, with that few of DREs in the state, the requirement that they have at least two years of experience on before they can even go to this class, um, this is kind of a technology-driven approach to help save lives. The equipment is tested, it's reliable, uh, there have been very big studies done in other states to prove this, but with that, I will yield to my colleague here uh, to explain the importance of how this works alongside with the committee. Stephen Johnson, Washington County Sheriff's Office, Forensic Science Division Director for the record. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Harris and members of the committee. Um, I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to Senate Bill 447. As a member of the Nevada Committee on Testing for Intoxication, a former 
uh, forensic analyst of alcohol for the state of Nevada and the current director for the Washington County Sheriff's Office Forensic Science Division, I do believe that it is vital that we continue to pursue advancements in technology that may, ass that may assist in creating safer uh, roads. Oral fluid testing is one of those technologies uh, that may assist law enforcement officers within their DUI investigations. Oral fluid testing uses a well-established immunoassay technology to look for the presence of specific drug compounds in oral fluid. Uh, this is the same type of technology used in like a home pregnancy test or a COVID-19 test kit. Uh, the drug compounds vary from test kit to test kit, but are usually designed to detect common drugs of abuse such as THC, opiates, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Oral fluid testing is a qualitative test, means that the, the test kits test for the presence or absence of the specific drugs on that um, test kit. And this type of test is best suited as a presumptive or preliminary test, not an evidential test. My team and I were asked to review Senate Bill 447 and provide feedback, and in doing so, we submitted some recommendations to amend this bill. And I'm going to go through those in detail and explain a little bit why these, these recommendations were submitted. Sections 1 and 14 provide law enforcement with the ability to attain a preliminary oral fluid sample to determine the presence of a controlled substance. Uh, we didn't see any issues with, with these sections. Sections 2 through 5 include oral fluid in license revocation status, uh, statutes, excuse me, specifically NRS. 44C.210.220.230 and.240. Uh, oral fluid testing does not provide direct evidence of impairment nor time of substance use. Oral fluid testing can be used to determine the presence of a substance um, that is on that test kit. So until further research is conducted into the correlation between positive oral fluid and impairment, uh, we suggested removing um, the language in those sections. Sections 5 through 13 and 15 through 17 adds end drug impairment to the name for the Committee on Testing for Intoxication. Intoxication is a term that can be used for both alcohol and drug impairment. The addition to the committee's name does not change the committee's role, nor does it uh, clarify its purpose. So we recommend just removing that language as well. Section 5 adds or oral fluid testing. Uh, device as applicable to subsection 4 of NRS 44C.240. This subsection requires evidence of a device to be calibrated and maintained as required by the Committee on Testing for Intoxication. Calibration has a very specific meaning in science and metrology and refers to a systematic approach to demonstrate the accuracy and precision of uh, quanti uh, excuse me, a quantitative device, measuring device. Current oral fluid testing devices do not fit within that scope of calibration, nor does the committee have established requirements for these types of de devices, so we recommended removing that language as well. Um, sections 9 through 11 include oral fluid testing to the scope on the Committee for, on Testing for Intoxication in NRS 44C, 610, 620, and 630. Um, Assembly Bill 239, as amended, provides expanded language to the Committee on Testing for Intoxication in NRS 44C.640 to allow the committee to study and make recommendations for technology and methods of detecting and determining the presence uh, and the effect of driving under the influence of alcohol controlled substances and prohibited substances. So the language in as amended in Assembly Bill 239 would allow these recommendations and requirements uh, to be applied to oral fluid testing and would include the goals set forth in sections 9 through 11 of this uh, current bill. So we recommended removing the, this language in, the, in these sections in support of the language currently in, uh, with Assembly Bill 239. Section 15 adds oral fluid language to various subsections in NRS 48.480. Um, Assembly Bill 239, also as amended, would add the language to support oral fluid and other samples as allowed. And so, just as before, we recommend removing this language um, in support of the current language in Assembly Bill 239. 
Section 16 adds oral fluid language to various subsections in NRS 50.315. The statute specifically addresses affidavit and declaratory language for activities commonly performed by forensic analysts of alcohol for evidential breath testing devices. As described um, earlier, or oral fluid testing should not be used, should only be used as a preliminary, uh, for preliminary purposes to support DUI investigations. Um, calibrations may not apply to oral fluid testing devices, and the Committee on Testing for Intoxication does not currently have uh, established requirements here. So we recommended removing this language. And then lastly, subsection, excuse me, section 17 adds oral fluid language to various subsections through NRS 50.320. This statute specifically addresses affidavit or declaratory language for expert witnesses regarding the quantity of a controlled substance or alcohol in a sample. And then as mentioned above, oral fluid looks at the uh, qualitative results, not the quantitative. Um, so we recommended removing this language. Oral flu fluid testing can be an effective tool for law enforcement agencies and can further enhance their ability uh, to investigate driving under the influence cases. With the recommendations that I've just outlined, as well as the language in Assembly Bill 239, the state can implement a robust and effective oral fluid testing program that will create safer, safer roads for Nevada. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time. And um, I have my colleague, or David Astles, who is a criminalist with the Washington County Sheriff's Office. And he is one of our current forensic analysts of alcohol for the state of Nevada here as well to help answer any technical questions regarding this science. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, David Astles uh, from the Washoe County Sheriff's Office Forensic Science Division. I don't have any prepared remarks, but I'm prepared to at least attempt to answer any technical questions the community might have. And we appreciate that. Committee members, any questions? Okay, I have one. Why would we require drivers to consent to a test just by getting out in a vehicle that may indicate they haven't done anything illegal? Thank you for the question, Captain Eddie Bowers, Nevada Highway Patrol. Um, they're not required to submit to this test. Um, in last session, uh, the bill number escapes me, but uh, the requirement that they, there's no administrative sanction for somebody refusing to submit to a preliminary breath test for alcohol. Uh, they removed those sections last section, last session rather, this time uh, with uh, the addition would be under 44C150, uh, the PBT law. I don't know if that one's structured differently than what's in the legislative session from last time. But so I'm, I'm looking at refuse. it. I'm looking at it right now. Mm -hmm. Did you say your name for the record? Eddie Bowers, I did. Yes. Okay, great. I'm looking at it right now, and it says, any person sh shall be deemed to have given, given his or her consent to a preliminary test. And based upon what I heard from you, it is not illegal for me to have, let's say, 50 nanograms or whatever the measure is of meth, but that's going to trip a positive test. Yes. Okay. So I'm, I'm just not sure how we avoid forcing people to consent be, just by the virtue of driving to a, a test that isn't quite capable of giving you a are you intoxicated under the law or not okay. result. Does that make sense? Yes. And I'll tell you that Nevada's law has changed to that somebody can refuse this test. They can tell me hey, I don't want to do that oral fluid test, I'm not going to do that. Um, that's not going to result in a sanction on them for that. They can refuse a preliminary breath test. This is a court case that, that changed this, this part of the law. Now, with respect to an impaired driving offense, if somebody comes back as a positive reading for methamphetamine, um, there are, there are other factors. A positive reading on this test doesn't equal DUI arrest. It's, it's like one piece to a puzzle. I mean, it's a corner piece. It's a good piece. You know where it goes. I mean, there, but there's still, in most puzzles, four other corners. You have to have other factors. You can't just prove an impaired driving offense because of a positive test. It, the same has been said for like a preliminary breath test for alcohol. So everything factors in in a totality of circumstances. That's the lens with which we look at it. So 
I think I'd suggest alcohols a bit differently because we do have a per se law here. And if you blow over 0.08, even if you don't think you're intoxicated, by law you are, right? Correct. And so, you know, there's an a opportunity, yes, for you to blow under the limit, and that doesn't mean you're not intoxicated. Correct. And that would be similarly true here. Maybe you have less, but you could also have 25 nanograms and the you would test negative and still be intoxicated, right? And so I don't know how we, um, I, I don't know how the functionality operates the same when you're tripping at an arbitrary number that's unrelated to the law. Is, is there any opportunity or any science coming around where these will be able to be quantitative and not just qualitative? There is, and I'll let uh, one of my colleagues speak to that. David Astos, for the record. Um, so we have to first distinguish between the amount of a substance in the blood versus the amount of substance in oral fluid um, saliva, basically. And uh, right now the science is a bit unclear or contradictory as to the relationship between amounts that would be detectable in oral fluid and amounts that would be detectable in blood. There's a, there seems to be a fairly positive correlation between presence in oral fluid and presence in blood. That's why, um, that's why we view this as more appropriate as a preliminary tool as opposed to an evidentiary tool because of that lack of direct correlation. So as, as Captain Bowers indicated, it ha can have a role as, a, as an investigative tool for the officer, but we don't believe that the science supports going any further than that at this point in time. But it is constantly being researched. Many jurisdictions have been undertaking pilot studies, uh, some more in-depth than others. For example, the state of Alabama has a program that has both, um, both roadside oral fluid testing combined with preservation of an oral fluid sample for subsequent lab testing combined with blood testing and they're building data on those, kinds of, on those kinds of issues. As you can imagine, a lot of the research in this area has been difficult because of the illegality of the substances. So it's, it is a developing field and there are, there are gaps in the knowledge. I'm just gonna speak as a, as a lay person and I'll let my um, colleagues sort of jump in, but- Name for the record. Thank you, Amy Davey, um, Office of Traffic Safety. So my understanding of how this would be used would be in the totality of um, a law enforcement officer witnessing some type of event that would um, uh, cause them to want to engage uh, in that, uh, with that driver. Um, standard field sobriety testing would be conducted. Um, a PBT would also be conducted. There are times when the device um, where you can't understand or, or necessarily explain why you're witnessing or observing signs of impairment and the device can help you with that. The device can also show you negative and, and that can help you understand that maybe this person has some other type of impairment and needs some uh, you know, additional assistance and just um, getting home for the night or something. Um, so I, I think that, you know, kind of going back to it, it's part of the overall um, understanding of how to proceed with that decision at the roadside because the next thing that happens really is that the evidential testing takes place and because we don't have a standard process across our state for evidential testing in other words the law enforcement officer would make an arrest decision take somebody in and order the evidential testing that might stop at a 0.08 so if they have a 0.08 alcohol the testing wouldn't go any further this um, device may um, let the officer know, I need to request a drug test as well to understand exactly what's going on. So maybe they're you know, 0.05 or they're 0.06, but something's going on and um, the, the combination is that we're seeing impairment and we need to continue that 
um, investigative process. That's kind of my layman's version of it. I, okay. So is, am I correct in understanding that currently today, even if you blow a .06, if you're impaired, you're impaired. Is that correct? Uh, Captain Eddie Bowers, for, for the record, that, that's correct. Uh, that's, uh, you can be under an 08, but if it were just that and you didn't exhibit signs of impairment in the other field sobriety tests, it's highly unlikely anybody would be arrested for that, uh, nor should they. But if they're performing field sobriety tests and they're exhibiting clues of impairment on the NHTSA standardized tests, and their driving was very poor, so there's other factors to consider. I mean, I might have stopped somebody for something as benign as going 10, 15 miles per hour over the speed limit, and then I get up there and I you know, see some indicators, I bring them out, I give them field sobriety tests, and maybe they perform fairly poor, and then I give them a preliminary breath test for alcohol that says nothing, and I explore a possibility of drug use, and they're like, no, I don't do drugs. I'm just very physically, I have bad balance and everything. And I'm like, okay, let me give you this other test. And then I test them, or their oral fluid, and then that comes back negative. It's just a way to kind of see the whole picture of what's going on in a person to either not make an arrest decision or, you know, here's a guy that in this example I'm giving that did poorly on, on his performance of field sobriety tests. Driving was fine apart from speeding poor field sobriety tests, but yet negative on alcohol and drugs. So it's just, it's just a tool. So I guess, I guess my concern is that if there's all these other indications of impairment, even if tests come back negative, maybe they're still impaired, right? And so you're going to need to use your judgment. And in that instance, the tests weren't helpful. Or conversely, uh, maybe someone does poorly on the test and there is something else going on with them, but they trip positive because they're at 0 0.30 and that wasn't causing their impairment, right? And, but now that person is going to jail, even though they are under what would be the per se limit, right? So it seems to me all of the tools that we have today to judge impairment are much better indicators than an oral fluid test that's going to trip you positive even below the legal limit. Does, do, do you get what I'm worried about a little bit here? Is, am I making any sense? This is uh, Steve Johnson for the record. Um, just to one point of clarification, and I, and I think this is important, um, is the, the results on an oral fluid test aren't the same as the results on a blood sample. So when we're looking at per se's, we don't have per se's for oral fluid testing. Um, and we cannot correlate an oral fluid result to a, a blood per se. And so that's a very important distinction that, that we need to make there. Um, the other thing too, and, and again, like my um, colleague Dave Astles mentioned that this is, this is something, it's just a tool that would be able for, for law enforcement to be able to help make their determinations um, out in the field. And, to the point of if there is, if they are making observations, as, as you had um, just previously mentioned, no alcohol signs from a PBT or preliminary breath testing device, um, and no positive results from an oral fluid, there could be a medical event there too as well that we may, that law enforcement officers may be able to respond to. So this is, it, it's a tool. It's, it should not be used to show um, signs of impairment, it should, or it's, it should, be not, it should not be used to um, convict on impairment. Um, the other tests would have to be done. And the, the one benefit to this is it's non-invasive. So the one, I think one of the questions you asked was if a law enforcement officer didn't see and it had signs and symptoms of impairment, there was no alcohol, well the next step would have to be to, if they believed it was a drug uh, on board, they would have to go then for a phlebotomy to draw blood. So this would be an opportunity to check that prior to um, and help with that. Okay, one last thing I promise. So I, I understand that it's a tool. What I'm trying to figure out, is it a good one? What is the correlation between whatever comes out in this oral fluid test, positive or negative, how well 
how well correlated is that to determining whether some, someone's impaired? Or are all of the other things that you all do for field sobriety much more correlated to impairment? And this is just kind of a neat thing that does something, right? And you may use it, but I don't know if that means you should be using it. This is David Astles uh, for the record. So I think it's important to distinguish that in the Nevada statute, there is a distinction between impairment and per se violations. And therefore, assessing impairment is based on the totality of circumstances, um, including you know driving pattern, observations of the driver, uh, behavior and field sobriety testing, and that sort of thing. Um, the use of a, an oral fluid test at the roadside could then give an indication of whether that impairment was being caused by some illicit drug, for example, without necessarily a reference to the per se statutes. So it's possible that there would also be a per se violation, but there doesn't need to be a per se violation if there's demonstrable impairment. So the two kind of go hand in hand. And in that sense, um, it is a tool with limitations. And this is where Assembly Bill 239 came in with putting the responsibility under the Com Committee for Testing for Intoxication where um, proper investigation of the tool, development of regulations, development of any appropriate training programs for law enforcement officers would come into play to uh, indicate when it would be appropriate to use that tool. So it, it is a tool like any tool, it's got its strengths, its weaknesses, and, and this is where uh, AB 239 would address that so that we put some boundaries or constraints on the use of that tool. Okay, so I said I had one last question, but I lied. I'm sorry. Could you right now today ask a driver to consent to one of these tests? And if the answer is yes, then why do we need to mandate consent just by getting behind the vehicle? Uh, Captain Eddie Bowers, uh, for the record. Um, Ma'am, it's my feeling that I don't think, I think a driver per the law, I know what you're reading there in front of you, but there is case law that says they can tell me no to that. They can tell me no, and that's how the police officers in the field today are operating. Um, if somebody refuses a preliminary breath test for alcohol, that's not an automatic arrest decision. There's no sanction for that. Um, you did mention before that why would we use this uh, device if we have these other tests that are good? And yeah, NHTSA put out these tests a long time ago. I think the Southern California Research Institute in 1981 started defining field sobriety tests that were they considered were valid. Um, none of them are 100 percent. You know, it started off with I think the horizontal gaze nystagmus test being 77 percent likely that somebody would be impaired over a 0.10. Uh, the human body is very different, you know, and and different people, different bodies, different pe people get used to having different levels of substances in their body. Um, the thing with a classroom environment when we teach students, you know, there's three phases of detection, vehicle in motion, driver contact, and pre-arrest screening, you know. Um, in a perfect world, maybe you get all of those things. I see a vehicle driving poorly, I monitor it, I stop it, I get up, I contact the driver, they present slurring speech, order of alcohol, things about their eyes, and then I give them the standardized field sobriety test and they show some of those clues of impairment. Um, that sounds great in a textbook, right? But in the real world, sometimes you show up to the scene of a crash where somebody's tire just fell off and now they're there on the side of the highway and you smell alcohol on them so you don't have vehicle in motion anymore. Maybe they were injured to an extent in that crash that they can't do the some of the tests. So this is, and then in a case like that, if it was alcohol, maybe you'd give them this technology piece, you know, like a preliminary, preliminary breath test for alcohol. It's no different than uh, with this oral fluid device. It's just an, an added piece of technology that's come about um, to help an officer decide whether or not something's at issue. I would suggest the difference is a qualitative versus quantitative piece, right? And I think I'd be more comfortable if it could tell you how much was, was present as you can with, with alcohol. 
Um, ha has this discussion spurred any additional questions? Senator Hansen. Of course, lots of them. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, okay, well, you guys have probable cause. You got some guy weaving around on the road. You pull him over. Um, you do all your current tests. You have a compelling state interest in protecting the other drivers on the roadway because this guy may have an issue. This is simply a tool to help um, reach that conclusion is what I'm kind of getting at when, as I understand this. Is that kind of what we're driving at here? I mean, it's obviously none of the tools you've mentioned are 100% perfect every time. Um, so by extending this to oral fluids and using this tool, you help uh, basically make the roadways potentially safer by getting an impaired driver off the road. Not a perfect tool though. It still sounds like it's still got some bugs, which is obviously one of the chair's concern. But in your opinion, is it, uh, you know, since you guys have the responsibility of protecting all the other drivers from people that c could potentially cause them harm, is this tool um, an advancement over your current practices? Captain Eddie Bowers, for the record, I couldn't agree with you more. It is absolutely an advancement and a game changer in providing officers a tool to help them save lives. Um, if it is, a, you know, when you put it that way, uh, you can consider that everybody might think of uh, an impaired driver perhaps crashing and harming another. Um, so you're saving that person from harm. But I, I always looked at it like, every person that I've arrested for an impaired driving offense, well, I know I saved that one. Uh, they're not going to hurt themselves. So it's just an added tool. It's an extra thing. It's, it has been proven reliable. When you ask that question, I mean, you're asking it to somebody who back in 2009 began using these devices, working with manufacturers, and doing little studies at their request where somebody would be provided a test swab, that sample would be tested by the device. Another sample would be provided to a cooperative suspect. They would swab their mouth with that one. That would be sent off to a lab in Pennsylvania that is renowned uh, for their ability to test uh, such substances. And then if an arrest was made, that person's taken to the jail. And then a third test is taken, a blood test. So you would have three now, three pieces of data that all point to one conclusion that yes, that person did have um, an illegal substance in their body and that of course the blood test would tell precisely how much. So it is, in my opinion, a very reliable, accurate tool that's been around for at least since 2009. Well, now the chair brought up something that where she and I both share a very common concern and that is we don't like people being uh, essentially uh, forced to self-incriminate. Okay. You mentioned earlier in your testimony, though, that this is, they can basically say, I'm sorry, I don't want to say anything, I don't want to take the test, yeah, I'm gonna, you can talk to my lawyer, I'm not cooperating any further. Is that, if this passes, would they still have that right of, uh, against self-incrimination? And if they do, do do that, do you guys, well, let's ask that first. I will have a follow-up if I could, Madam Chair. I would say absolutely anybody, if I leave here right now and I stop somebody and I smell Name alcohol. Name for the record. Oh, I'm sorry, Eddie Bowers for the record. If I leave here today and I stop somebody and I smell alcohol on them and I say, hey, come on out, and they're slurring their speech and I see these things, those, that person can tell me, I'm not answering any of your questions. Well, can I look at your eyes? Can I give you the HGN test, the horizontal gaze? And I say, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Will you walk? Nope. Will you stand on one leg? Nope. Will you blow into this device? Nope, not going to do that. And maybe when I asked them out of the car, they kind of staggered to the back. Well, that's all I got. <laughs> I'm going to arrest them. Um, I have to. I can't let them go down the road. Um, if, you know, they participate, if they say, uh, but I'm arresting them not because they refuse to do the test that I asked of them. I'm arresting them because of what I feel is a possible impairment in the things that they gave me. And in a perfect world, you don't get everything, but you have to take what you get. Well, that was actually my next question. So at that point, what do you guys do? Uh, you're basically, you, know, you, you have a, a, an added responsibility of protecting the safety of the other people on the roadway. So I'm drunk and I don't want to cooperate and call my lawyer, you know. Yeah, I'm sure you've had examples of that. And oh, then yes. at that point, though, you will still need to arrest them, not because they're not cooperating, but simply to protect other people on the roadway from possible harm. 
I mean, even themselves, I guess, was another point you made. You know, like you said, if I arrest Ira Hansen, who's drunk and won't cooperate, at least I know after I get him off the road, that when he sobers up, hopefully at least he didn't hurt, harm himself by continuing to drive, and even worse, harming somebody else possibly. Absolutely, absolutely. And then to give more weight to some Name of the things Name for the record. Sorry, again, <laughs> Eddie Bowers. First time I've ever done this, sorry. Eddie Bowers for the record. I will tell you that... Um, Conversely, I, I have stopped vehicles. Uh, I've smelled strong odors of marijuana. Um, marijuana is legal now, so okay. Um, come on out. Will you do some tests? I'm going to pass. You know, and it's like, okay, that's fine. Uh, will you do this? No, I'm not going to do that either, but I stopped them maybe for um, being expired for more than 60 days. <laughs> but you know and then I stop him for that but and, and then I smell marijuana I forgive my, my pun but um, I stop them for ha I, for being expired and then I smell marijuana but they are lucid they are articulate there's there's nothing there for me to say well I smell marijuana so I'm arresting them um, I, I could test them with maybe the oral fluid if they cooperated with that and it could say positive but that doesn't matter. I mean, a positive reading for something like marijuana isn't an issue based on the changes in the law. You would have to have something more in a totality of circumstances to say that somebody was impaired and should be but, arrested. But your, your responsibility as an officer is, to, uh, officer is to err on the side of caution, though, right? Certainly. I mean, if I'm, you know, slurring speech, or even if, like you, the example you just gave, marijuana, but you notice by following me that I've been being erratic or whatever it is you guys are looking for, and you have a probable cause to pull me over, you would, if, if in doubt, you would keep that person off the roadway, I would assume. Eddie Bowers, for the record, absolutely. Public okay. safety is the goal in everything. I got it. Thank you. All right, we'll go to Senator Pazina and then Vice Chair Spearman. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, question. So... If someone were to consent to the oral fluid test and they were to test positive, though under the legal limit, does that automatically give law enforcement the opportunity to then do a blood test? Captain Eddie Bowers, for the record, uh, no, it does not. There, in order for me to compel, command, or request any type of evidentiary testing, I have to build to that end. Uh, there is no one singular thing that... Um, if you have this, then they have to uh, be arrested or are now compelled to submit to a test. Um, ever since the McNeely case changed everything with respect to um, somebody could say, no, I'm even going to refuse to a blood test now that you've arrested me. Then I have to make an application for a seizure order from a judge. And I would tell that judge that everything that has led to my request for this evidentiary blood test, I would tell them what I saw, what I smelled. If I gave them an oral fluid test, I would tell the judge uh, I gave them an oral fluid test and it tested positive for cocaine. Uh, because of those factors, I'm requesting a seizure order for a blood test. And if the judge thinks I have probable cause, they may issue a seizure order for, for a blood test. Uh, David Astos for the record here. I, I would just like to clarify that the uh, roadside oral fluid testing that we're talking about would not give any kind of quantitative indication that would suggest they were above or below any kind of illegal per se limit. It would simply say presence or absence of one of the categories of drugs tested. So it's simply an indication that that class of drug is at play in that particular case. That's the extent of the information that it provides. Senator Spearman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I guess I just have a, about testing, or not testing, but training. <clears throat> so there are some medical conditions that, that present as intoxicated. Uh, and I'm thinking about one, I think it's called Otto Brewery Syndrome. That's where someone can eat bread or any type of starch or uh, carbohydrates, and instead of <clears throat> the body breaking it down as such, what happens is it converts that to a yeast-like substance that um, smells like alcohol. And so my question would be, we know, we know, we, I, th I think what we're hearing is that the test may not be perfect, but they shouldn't be the enemy of good. That's, I'm paraphrasing. So... Are, are people, are any of your officers trained in discerning low blood sugar, high blood sugar, 
and those things, you know, someone can present as intoxicated, but they're not. Um, slurred speech, you know, could be um, um, high blood pressure and, you know, some symptoms of stroke. And so I, I, would, I would just be concerned that someone was able to discern or have some question about, well, maybe this is, and if they are arrested, uh, and then they, they get information from a doctor, they can bring information from a doctor that says, no, this person, this is something that they're being treated for, and they would not be intoxicated. The, the auto brewery syndrome, though, they're gonna, you, they're gonna smell like alcohol. Uh, Captain Eddie Bowers, for the record. Uh, great example, uh, especially with respect to possible diabetes. Um, we're trained in the academy that somebody um, Maybe my scientific people will help me here. This is, uh, I think it's a keto acidosis or something like that is when you're having a, um, this could produce um, kind of an odor of alcohol. Um, breath testing devices would likely read that as an interferent um, because it is not the um, type of alcohol that evidential tests are trained to look, are designed to look for. Um, but yes, officers are trained at the academy level to rule out medical impairment by asking a host of uh, medical questions to discern whether or not somebody's taking prescription medication, uh, whether or not they are ill or hurt or have any physical or mental defects or currently be seen by a doctor. There is always the opportunity to consider that. And, you know, being a police officer some 23 years, I have encountered just that, you know, people that are having a diabetic episode, and it is helpful to figure that out right away so that you can now get them the appropriate medical care to bring their blood sugar up. Uh, David asked us for the record. Um, I'd like to add that um, under, under the Nevada regulations for evidentiary breath testing, officers are required to be recertified every three years. And um, only state certified forensic analysts of alcohol, such as myself, are allowed to train those officers in evidentiary breath testing. So uh, I and my colleagues have contact with every officer in Nevada at least once every three years for that training. And I know I personally, and I believe my colleagues, all speak to issues as you mentioned. For example, in the uh, the NHTSA training for, uh, for DUI detection, when it talks about the role of preliminary breath testing, one of the important roles of the roadside preliminary breath uh, tester is to ascertain whether the amount of alcohol that one is seeing is consistent with the level of impairment that one has seen through the other parts of the investigation. And uh, if it's not, then one has to ask questions, okay, well, what else is going on? If, if someone is seeing impairment, but there's a low alcohol level, then, the, then that triggers the question, what else is going on? It could be drugs or it could be a medical issue. Having an additional tool like roadside oral fluid would more quickly answer that question about, is it likely drugs or is it potentially a medical issue that requires a different kind of response? So. Uh, in answer to your question, yes, officers are trained in that. They have to recertify regularly. We regularly talk about these kinds of issues, about ascertaining what the source of impairment is. And so having another tool in that toolbox would be helpful from that regard. Okay, I have many more questions, but I'm only going to ask one because I asked it before and I don't think we got an answer. Can you today? ask a driver to consent to one of these oral fluid tests? Captain Eddie Bowers, for the record, we can ask them and they can refuse. Okay. So why sections 1 and 14? I'll start. Captain Eddie Bowers, for the record, I'll begin. Perhaps um, my colleague would want to follow along. But... Um, at present, I use this device. Let's say I ask somebody to um, swab their mouth. They do. I get a reading positive for some substance. Um, then I ask that person, okay, I, I arrest them, and then I ask them, hey, will you freely and voluntarily consent to a chemical test of your blood to determine the drug content in your system? Before you answer, you can refuse me this request. 
but if you do, there's a license sanction, and I will ask a judge if I may have a warrant. They may refuse me, but if they grant a warrant, then we're going to do a blood test. Now, let's say that person says, nope, I'm not going to do it. I said, okay, and then I do everything that I said. I get in touch with a judge. I make an application for a seizure order. I tell that judge that I used an oral fluid device, and it produced a reading of positive for a substance, and that judge gives me a warrant. This is now something to be argued. That's why the committee is so important in this process to, to approve a device because now a defense can make a motion, right, to say, you know, Your Honor, respectfully, you made a decision based off information that is potentially flawed. A device was used that's not scientifically proven or reliable. It's just something that they used. Um, that's why I think the committee's involvement in this is very important. They're the scientists that look at the data provided by the manufacturer and tell police officers whether or not this is a reliable piece of equipment to use. So this statute is so very important, this bill is so very important because it kind of removes that cloud of suspicion, you know, and it helps judges make correct decisions too based on reliable equipment. So. I think you're inadvertently making my point for me. And that is that the standards and stuff and all of that is important and should probably come before we tell people that just by getting behind the vehicle, you've given your consent to take this test, given especially that you can already administer them. And if they don't comply, based upon all of the other indicators, still arrest them, go through the proper channels to get a warrant, to take their blood exam if they don't want to. It seems to me you already have the ability to do what you're seeking to do through this bill, especially since you've gutted the other pieces, right? And that the, was it AB 268? Is that the bill? Steve Johnson, for the record, 239. AB 239 seems to be the important piece that you need to put the weight behind the science, not sections 1 and 14. You don't have to respond to that. Thank you. You did a great job. Appreciate you. Um, we'll open it up for testimony if that's okay, y'all. Okay. Anyone here in Carson City to testify in support of Senate Bill 447, go ahead and come on forward. Take the seats. And if you're in Las Vegas to testify in support, go ahead and take your seats as well. We'll get to you in just a second. Good afternoon, Madam Chairman and Committee. I'm Cheryl Bloomstrom. I represent the Nevada Trucking Association. We support Senate Bill 447 and the addition of oral fluid testing to determine impairment. Every truck driver is required to pass a pre-employment drug test and submit to random drug testing. Before the implementation of the Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse, which is administered by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, and that happened in January of 2020, didn't seem like there were very many um, or not much of a big drug problem in the trucking industry in Nevada. There were barely double digits and then we started testing. And at the end of December, there were 1,846 truck drivers declared um, prohibited status. They have an ability to correct their prohibited status, but they were off the road and we have in our industry a zero tolerance for any kind of substance for obvious reasons. Um, through the end of last year, 120,000 drivers nationwide had their CDLs pulled or placed in prohibited status. 57.2% um, of those positive tests were for marijuana. Um, we know there are issues surrounding the testing for marijuana and that is why Nevada has moved away from urine tests for marijuana and now require blood tests for DUIs. The Trucking Association has been fortunate to work with um, Dr. Todd Simo, the Chief Medical Officer of Higher Right, in developing recommendations for our industry that we believe will better detect impairment. To quote him, with the ever-shifting sands of marijuana decriminalization, Oral fluid is the one current drug testing specimen that can be used to make a determination of occupational safety impairment at the time of collection. The reason is that oral fluid's known detection window is 20 hours or less. However, there is a growing evidence that the THC causes impairment for periods greater than 24 hours. This means that if someone tests positive for marijuana, the THC in marijuana, using oral fluid, 
The donor is most likely impaired or under the influence at the time of collection, and any adverse employment action taken is based upon impairment and not just simply being positive, impairment versus usage. This impairment determination may allow employers to take negative employment action on candidates and employees, even in states that require accommodation for decriminalized marijuana use. Thank you. Thank you. And I didn't say it at the beginning, but I'll say it now. Two minutes, please. Ms. Schmidt. Chair Harris and members of the committee, my name is Beth Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T. I represent the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, and we do support SB 447. The LVMPD is experiencing an increase in drug-related drug DUIs, and preliminary breath tests, which is one of the tools that we are currently using, are only able to detect the presence of alcohol. PBTs are not able to assist in determining if drugs are the intoxicant that are potentially affecting a driver's ability to operate a vehicle on a roadway. Adding oral fluids testing to the law as presented in this bill would greatly enhance the ability to conduct effective DUI investigations in the field by helping law enforcement officers detect if drugs are present. We believe that this tool will help officers save lives. LVMPD supports SB 447. Before you run away, quick question. Does LVMPD currently use oral fluid testing? No, the LVMPD does not. Why not? We haven't used it. We, we're, we support it. We are in support of bringing that in if, um, you know, it's just a tool that we don't have. We have PBTs right now. But my understanding is the current state of the laws, you could be using them. You just aren't. Yes, is that we, correct? Correct. That is right. Yeah. Okay. We, we just don't have that technology, but we feel that's where the science is going, and that's why we are, we are in support of the bill. But just to clarify, you don't need the law change to do that. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Walk. Good afternoon, Chair Harris, members of the committee, Jason Walker, J-A-S-O-N-W-A-L-K-E-R, uh, Washington County Sheriff's Office testifying support, Senate Bill 447. Sergeant Schmidt said everything that I was going to say, and Washoe County uh, would like to use this tool. Um, I believe any additional tools, resources that can assist us to arrive at a proper decision is a good thing. Um, it's my opinion, DUIs are getting more difficult to investigate unless somebody's fallen over drunk from consuming too much. Um, again, this is simply just a factor in the totality of a DUI investigation. Thank you. Just to be fair, I'm going to ask you the same questions. Does Washoe County currently use oral fluid testing? Jason Walker, no, we don't. Could you currently use oral fluid testing if you so chose? If we had access to that technology and we chose to use that as a factor in determining, absolutely we would. And so you do not need the law change to be able to do that. Is that right? Correct. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Harris, members of the committee, Greg Herrera for the record, H-E-R-R-E-R-A, -R -R -E -R representing Nevada Sheriff's and Chiefs Association. We're also in support of Senate Bill 447. I'd like to thank the presenters today for bringing this information forward. The Nevada Sheriff and Chiefs support this opportunity, or excuse me, support the opportunity to have additional tools and technology to help law enforcement personnel in determining impairment and helping keep our roadways safer throughout Nevada. Thank you. <laughs> Retired Greg Herrera for the record. <laughs> he gets, Mr. Herrera. Mr. Hansen would like to ask, Senator Hansen would like to ask you a question. Actually, all the law enforcement folks. All right, bottom line that the chair's driving at is in the absence of the passage of this law, why aren't you guys using that stuff currently? And if the law is not passed that, that we're trying to get to here, you have that ability now. Does the law somehow, if, if it's passed, give you an enhanced opportunity in court? I mean, what I'm looking at is that that was the impression I got from the from, from uh, Captain Bauer, is that something the law enforcement community wants because they're afraid that when they take these issues to court that, in fact, the, 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 the state hasn't given you kind of the green light to use it and therefore a defense attorney will say, well, this is a, I'm sorry, Your Honor, this, my client was prosecuted on something that hasn't even been approved by the state. It's, it's a, a technology that is unproven to such a point that even the state of Nevada refused to put this in the law. Greg Herrera, for the record, uh, Senator Hansen, uh, based upon 
um, hearing Captain Bauer testify, that is, you know, a concern, and that is my belief as well. Okay, well, that's kind of what I was getting at. I see where the chair is going, and I, you know, I, 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 I respect that a lot because, you know, if you don't need a law, I don't want a new law. But on the, in the absence of passing this bill, are we actually going to somewhat handicap and, and handcuff your abilities to protect the, the your, your compelling need to protect the public's uh, safety on the roadways? It's, you know, it's kind of one of those juggling acts for us. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, I'm not seeing anyone in Las Vegas for support. We'll go ahead and go to the phone lines, BPS, anyone on the phones to support Senate Bill 447. If you would like to testify in support of Senate Bill 447, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, anyone here in Carson City who'd like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 447? Good afternoon, Chair, members of the committee. My name is Erica Roth, E-R-I-C-A-R-O-T-H, on behalf of the Washoe County Public Defender's Office, testifying in opposition this afternoon. Um, I want to first touch on uh, the question that Senator Harris raised and I think was answered, is that the law is not required to change to implement this now. And what I think is important to note when we're talking about that is that there are many things right now that are utilized in a traffic stop, an investigation for driving un under the influence of both alcohol and um, controlled substances that are not in law. For example, the horizontal gaze nystagmus, the walk and turn, the one leg stand. We have not determine that those things need to go into statute. Now those three things also have something in common with this test, and that is that it is not scientifically proven. In fact, the opposite is true. I did a quick Google search sitting back there, and there are multiple peer-reviewed studies that find that the oral fluid test is not reliable. And this gets to my third point when we talk about what that means in court. If the purpose of this is to circumvent what is already set up in law to make sure that evidence that is used in criminal practice and trials against a person that can potentially take away their life and liberty, that needs to be reliable. And we don't put it into statute so that we can avoid a criminal defense attorney like me looking at that evidence and saying this is wrong and people shouldn't be subject to that because it will impact every single one of us. So we don't need to put bad science into statute. They have the ability now to do this already. Um, and I wanna make clear that, you know, I heard someone laugh earlier about arresting someone for a revoked uh, or not paying their uh, revocation fees or whatever that was. These arrests have real consequences, real collateral consequences that are in fact not funny. You can lose your liberty, your children, your job, your housing. And so when we're talking about putting something in statute, it needs to be reliable, and this is not that. I also want to touch briefly on the training. Now, we, I talked about the horizontal gaze and stagmus. I talked about the walk and turn. I said that those things have something in common with the oral fluid test being that it is not scientifically reliable. Now, as criminal defense attorneys, we raise that all the time, and the court says, yeah, it's not, but it's a factor that we consider and therefore we find there is probable cause, okay? But the problem is that this goes to Senator Spearman's question regarding training. I just pulled up the NHTSA. I believe that's the National Institute of Highway Safety. I may have gotten that acronym wrong, but that trains officers on how to conduct a roadside investigation for DUI. Um, I did a quit search. It was on my phone. I could not find anywhere that trains them for doing these oral fluid tests. So who is going to train them? Because the, tr the, the National Institute for Highway Safety is not currently training them on that. Um, and, and so that's another question. Uh, I believe I've probably reached my two minutes, and so I'll wrap it up. Yeah, you're at three minutes and 30 <laughs> seconds. Sorry. So with that, I oppose this bill. Thank you.
And Ms. Roth, um, before you go, if you if you were referring to the the vehicle registration, sixty days and over, he was making a reference to my traffic stop bill, not joking necessarily about the circumstances. Mr. Pirro. Thank you, Madam Chair. John Pirro from the Clark County Public Defender's Office. A couple things. Uh, we had no discussion about what are the known error rates. We had no discussion about what the national acceptance is on this. We have no discussion about has this been studied by the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, one of the things that's, I guess, I find most problematic is like the amendments removing calibration. Why? Because there's no calibration standards. The alcohol breath test is calibrated. They have to calibrate that. That's a known standard. It's used frequently. That's based on actual science. There's some issues here. There was a discussion of COVID-19 tests. I believe there was whole ads in the governor's race about false positive COVID-19 tests. And there's no standard for what kind of will be picked up by these. I think the science needs to be developed more before we put this into statute. And so that's my main concern and that's why I oppose this bill. I think this would be a great bill for a study I think we should study this. I think we should get some data on this before we put it into law in our state. And as far as Alabama using that, I will tell you Alabama is one of the false conviction capitals of the United States of America. I don't want to do anything that the state of Alabama does. Not here. Oh, you also have the pleasure of answering a question from Senator Hansen. No, uh, well, I, oh, thank you, Madam Chair. No, you know, we... We get along great, actually. The, the training on the oil, oral fluids testing, though, I, I, they, they, they aren't using it, so it makes sense they haven't had the training. I think if we put it in law, then they would then say, well, we better get tested on that. So, so that seems like, you know, isn't, it's kind of like not fair to say you haven't been trained because they're not doing it yet. Um, but the, the question is, the improvement in technology is always getting better. Um, and I, would, I, would, I think you guys have a great point that currently – this, I don't think it's to the point where we want to put it in statute. I think, judging from the chair's reaction in particular, Bill's probably got some difficulties. But as this technology improves, would it be something that we should put? And, and, and to, I mean, look, our, I understand as a defense attorney, your job is to help protect people from especially abusive law enforcement enforcement. On the other hand, they do have a compelling interest in protecting the other drivers on the roadways and stuff. I'm kind of wondering as I'm trying to juggle uh, you know, the, these two things, as these technologies improve, which I think they inevitably are doing, should we put it in statute? John Pirro for the record. A uh, couple things, right? Uh, as a criminal defense attorney, my job is to protect people accused of a crime, but I also do live in the community and I do care about our roads and being safe. We care about that. Uh, I think as the technology gets better and if we have a reliable data set, based on science that says these are the false positive error rates, this is what happens, this is what is actually picked up, then we should move forward with that, which was why I said this would be a great bill for a study, Senator. I think that part would, I think a study would be good so we could have a data set that we could look at and talk about and, and move forward from there. But until we get to that point, I don't think we should put that in the law yet. And we did talk about this word. We just keep saying presumption, presumption, presumption. You know what that means, though? It means you're going to jail. If you get that oral swab, Senator Hansen, and it tests positive for something, even if it's not accurate, you're going to jail. I'm going to jail. And anybody else who gets that oral swab is going to jail. So presumptive is a, a nice little word to say here in this hearing. But you're going to go to jail for 12 hours. And you're going to have to call Assemblywoman Hansen to come pick you up afterwards. <laughs> and it's not going to be a pleasant call. She would not draw my bail. I got news for you. Uh, all right. Last thing on, on the drug issue, though. There's, you know, so many different types of drugs now. The ability to detect. Obviously, if I'm drinking, they can smell it. What tools do they have currently um, to detect uh, unusual types of drugs when they, when they have a possible impairment uh, situation? Thank you, Chair. Um, to, through you to Senator Hansen, <laughs> Erica Roth for the record. So there are many tools and that's located in the NHTSA. Um, officers are trained on detecting um, impairment for controlled substances and marijuana. And this gets, I think, to the heart of the issue where I believe that we agree is that we do need an actual study. We need real data 
on who is impaired when they are under the influence. So for example, marijuana, as we all know, is now legal in the state of Nevada. Now I've seen marijuana DUIs where the person has not smoked marijuana for at least 24 hours, but they are a regular smoker. And what I tell my clients when they come in, I say, if you smoke marijuana, you can't drive. And I'm gonna tell everyone sitting up on the dais and everyone in the room, that's true. Because the when, when you do a blood draw, if you regularly smoke marijuana, you will get a DUI. So if they see red, bloodshot, watery eyes, which may or may not be related to um, being under the influence, you could have allergies. I had a client once who was arrested, brought in, almost lost his job. When they finally got the blood test results, he was on antihistamines. And he was a nervous guy. No criminal history. So, you know, we do need, I I absolutely agree, we need better data, better science backing up how we arrest and control who is on our roads. So I absolutely agree with that. Okay, I think we covered that pretty well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, um, let's go ahead and go down to Las Vegas. Looks like we have some folks who'd like to testify in opposition. I haven't been great at it, but two minutes. Greetings, Chair and esteemed committee members. Today, I'm so proud of you all. You guys have asked really, really good questions for our constituents. My name is Julie Montero, E-I-R-O, for the record. I am a co-founder and president of Integrated Providers Association and the Coalition for Patient Rights. Um, Currently, as written, we oppose Senate Bill 447. I concur with the last two oppositions that were stated. In addition, from a medical point of view, we are not sure who actually wrote this bill, but I have yet to see where a manufacturer or science is listed or specified. So I feel that it opens the door to impose a $60 fee on otherwise innocent civilians. In the event an officer is suspicious at the discretion of the officer and without basing it on any sort of peer-reviewed science, education, or professional standards, all of which are essential to successful science or program, especially in regards to prosecutorial procedure. No? And I have a question too. Will there be a fee waiver for underserved community members? And if so, when do they apply for it, before or after the unwarranted imposition on their Fourth Amendment? I'm interested to learn who validated the science beside this machine and who the manufacturer is. And a question for you all is why is science and manufacturers being kept as a secret? And is it because the science is kind of pseudoscience and as described earlier in this instance, only qualitative? And is it because the science is, and and unless you can disclose it, the Integrated Providers Association and its members of licensed providers must vehemently oppose it as written. According to the PubMed of National Institute of Health, police officers, lawyers, and even our judges have in fact reported pseudoscience in the past and some still do today. That's relying on the bodies of information that may appear to be scientific, but in reality, lack the characteristics of scientific knowledge. If you search Linfield, Lynn, and Lore 2014, you can learn for yourself, and I believe that's been submitted to you. In, re- in conclusion, You're we welcome our minutes. Nevada government and officials to reach out to us in the future as a source to assist in directing and future legislation to protect patient rights, safe alternatives to keep our residents safe, and laws that require education for the current regulations to avoid social stratification. Ma'am, you can go ahead and submit your record. Thank you. Submitted in writing as well, Thank please, okay? Well, Thanks. It's been submitted. Thank you so much, Senator Dallas. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time today. Greetings, Chair and esteemed committee committee members. My name is Katrice Saunders. I'm co-founder and vice president of government relations for Pardon Me Please, a national 501c3 dedicated to driving responsible change in social equity, inclusion, criminal justice, re-entry. As we have enough social stratifications as it is, I also serve in the Social Equity Council for the Coalition for Patients' Rights, national in Nevada. Many of you may know me as a prisoner of war for the failed drug work for the state of Nevada and federally. I am still here demanding a full pardon since everybody in the state is able to participate in the industry that I personally helped build for you and everybody else in a time when patient advisors also helped provide folks with medical guidance and when medical patients were actually being served by retail establishments. In that regards, please consider my testimony and know that I may come across angry. I am grateful for each and every one of you in your service. 
and the opportunity to respectful testify against Senate Bill 447, an additional social problem that it creates. As a medical cannabis patient, I take RSO for my chronic pain, fibromyalgia, severe migraine, and PTSD. RSO is fat soluble. The nanograms are invalid for people who use higher doses of medicine like me. This means that the nanograms of THC are detected in a person's oil fluid may not be accurate reflection of their intoxication level, thus putting vulnerable patients like myself at risk. Secondly, this bill would disproportionately impact patients who use higher doses of marijuana. These patients are more likely to have higher levels of THC in their oral fluid even if they are not impaired. Also recently, I was hired at Jell-O Checker Star Cab and I passed my drug test being a medical cannabis patient because we do not test in the state of Nevada for medical cannabis if you're looking for employment, as long as you're not impaired while driving, which is acceptable for public safety concerns. This is for a job that is commercially moving the people around and even a novice weekend smoker will find themselves in the crosshairs. And excuse me, however, at the discretion of an officer on top of the $60 fee sounds a lot like weaponized criminal justice to me. Will there be a few Ma'am, waiver you're for at your two minutes. If you could please submit you. your your comments to the committee. We'd love to awesome. get a chance to read the rest. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. Hello. <clears throat> Vicki Higgins for the record. The intent of this bill is good. We do not want impaired drivers on our roads. Unfortunately, it puts medical cannabis patients at risk for being penalized simply for using their chosen medicine. Not all cannabis patients are card holders. There are prohibitions for being a card holder, so it's not always inducive for people to be a card holder. Legal cannabis patients have been trying for decades to get this addressed. We know that nanogram levels are not a meter for impairment. The numbers are simply pulled from nowhere, and there is no scientific val validation for the nanogram numbers that supposedly indicate impairment. This method is not fair to legal medical ca cannabis patients, as a cannabis patient will always have nanograms in their system. Per se does not work. It's patently flawed. We need a reasonable way to determine impairment, and impairment should be assessed by trained, documented behavior by video cameras and the sighting officers, not nanogram levels. Use of this testing device creates social and medical discrimination. This, this bill does not define the device to be used for this testing. A proven device would be, should be listed as part of this bill. I cannot support this bill as written, but there has been very perceptive questions and answers discussed today, so I appreciate the fact that you're open to all the different options. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. BBS, can we go to the phones, please, for testimony in opposition to Senate Bill 447? If you would like to testify in opposition to Senate Bill 447, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Hi, my name is uh, Bod Angel Pisa. I'm a community health worker, co-founder and vice president of community relations for Pardon Me, Please. Uh, PMP is a national 501c3, and I also serve on the Health Care Council of the Coalition for Patient Rights, uh, National and Nevada. Many of you know me as an activist and community health worker. However, I've been a patient of Nevada for 15 years. I can tell you from experience that you are not helping anybody with this bill, other than the court systems and the criminal justice system in paying their salaries. I am uh, not sure who wrote this bill, but I have yet to see where the manufacturer or science is listed or specifics, um, but I do see a $60 fee that is imposed on otherwise innocent people. In the unusual event that an officer is suspicious, and let's not forget at the discretion of the officer without any basis in science, I am interested to learn who validated the science behind this device or if the manufacturer had it surveyed for a secondary con considerations like a third party manipulation. Who is the manufacturer? Why is science and the manufacturer being kept secret? So is it because the science is known as a uh, facetio science? Unless you can disclose it, PMP opposes it. According to uh, PubMed, of the National Institutes of Health, 
uh, police officers, lawyers, and even our judges have in fact resorted to procedural science in the past and some still do today. That's relying on bodies of information that may appear, but science uh, appear to be science, but in reality lack the characteristics of scientific knowledge. If you search linen fields, Lynn and Lore 2014, you can learn for yourself. I've attached the references uh, and submitted my opposition uh, comment as well. Thank you. And sir, before you go, can you just spell your name for the record, please? A B A D Angel A N G E L P I Z A. P I Z A. Okay, thank you so much. BPS next caller, please. Uh, James Creel, for the record, J-A-M-E-S-C-R-E-E-L, on behalf of the Center for Incubation and Findings Research. EIFR is the lead research institute for the Community-Based Clinical Cannabis Evaluation and Research Network. We've been researching cannabis for over two decades. We would like to echo what the Washoe County Public Defender's Office and Clark County Public Defender's Office, uh, Ross and Shapiro said about the lack of science in the in positions. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has bigger budgets and more experience than any of the sheriff's departments or state law enforcement agencies for that matter. And therefore we would like to leave it up to them to qualify and quantify the testing strategies that are deployed in the field for the standardized field sobriety tests. In that, uh, we would also like to point out that positive and negative is not enough info to base anything on. Some of you may have heard of people testing positive for opioids just by eating poppy seeds. If law enforcement can use the oral fluid test now without a new law, we recommend the law enforcement officers find a way to sharpen up their ass. The IFR, Cypher, and Compassion Center opposes Senate Bill 447, and we thank you for your time. Chair, there are no additional callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, thank you. Neutral testimony, Carson. Neutral Las Vegas. Neutral phones. If you would like to testify in neutral for Senate Bill 447, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on 447, but before I do, I just want to let you all know how much we appreciate you being here, and I hope you don't feel beat up because that was not my intention or the committee's intention at all, um, and we very much look forward to learning more about oral fluid testing as the technology develops. Ms. Davey, did you want to? Thank you, I really appreciate that. This is Amy Davey from the Office of Traffic Safety. There were just a few things that I did want to um, kind of uh, circle back on. Um, we, we didn't come today in the absence of science. I want you to know that. Um, that we certainly didn't bring the forensic scientists with us in the absence of science. What we didn't do was bring reams of scientific documents with us. When, um, when you talk about you know who will provide the standards, who will do the training, these are established. I did bring with me today a AAA Foundation a report, AAA, you know, pretty um, basic uh, sort of road safety organization, use of oral fluid to detect drug drivers, a toolkit, the IACP, which is the um, International Association of Chiefs of Police, they've put out uh, guidelines. Um, there's been some concern about devices. Um, devices are not specified in, in uh, scientific devices are not specified in statute for the, you know, the same reason we don't use PPT devices. There, there's devices put out by Abbott Laboratories. There's devices put out by other laboratories. So we're not relying on a, a, a Google search 
to tell us whether or not there is science. Um, Dr. Astles has, has done a pretty comprehensive um, research analysis himself of the science that's out there. 23 states use um, oral fluids and, and large pilot projects have been, um, have been completed on this. So I just wanted to make sure that, that you knew that we weren't coming here just sort of spitballing it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Every, every once in a while I have a moment. Um, and, and I'll let Dr. Astles just finish with some of, the, some of his f closing comments. Thank you. Thank you, David Astles, for the record. I just wanted to clarify a few things that some of the commentators um, raised. Uh, the issue around medical cannabis, for example, uh, there is no, there's currently no illegal per se level for THC in Nevada anymore. Therefore, um, there is, um, there is not the, there, one cannot be convicted of a DUI for an illegal per se violation of cannabis in the state of Nevada. It has to be proven by impairment only. Uh, so that, that is a, perhaps a misunderstanding of the current status of the statute as well. Because the oral fluid testing would be used as a presumptive investigative advice by law enforcement, there would not be a chemical testing fee associated with it for anybody. So uh, with respect to the manufacturers, there are a number of different manufacturers that are making oral fluid testing products. Most are designed for the employment market. There are some that are being marketed for the law enforcement market. In 2021, the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, or NHTSA, published an evaluation of five different manufacturers' devices. They found that two of them met a certain set of standards, three did not. Um, one of them is uh, Drager Technologies, which has been used by Highway Patrol here in Nevada. The other one um, is now owned by Abbott Labs. That's another uh, device is being tested in a number of jurisdictions across the country. One of the difficulties we have in looking at the data from other states is the differences in impaired driving laws. It's very difficult to compare one state's experience with another's because it's like it's apples to oranges in some cases. Uh, a, a state that has zero tolerance for controlled substances, for example, if their law prohibits driving with any detectable amount of a controlled substance, that's a different environment than a state that has, like Nevada, that has illegal per se levels for certain drugs. So this is one of the difficulties. The basic science behind the devices has been around for decades, as was mentioned. Um, it's the same technology that's used in any of those little test kits where you get the two lines on them, so like a COVID-19 test kit or a uh, home pregnancy test kit. None of those test kits are infallible, but they can be pretty good. Uh, the question was raised about known error rates and that the manufacturers do publish sensitivity and specificity data, which we have. Some of the pilot studies that we have access to have information which goes beyond that where we look at what, uh, we look at statistics called positive predictive value, which is if you get a positive, what is the likelihood that it's truly positive? Um, that, the, that is a somewhat different statistic that depends on how widespread the substance is in the population. So it's a very complex environment. And this is why... Mr. Astles, I hate to do this to you, but this one hearing has gone as long as I was hoping this whole committee meeting would go. <laughs> if I... And so can you... Wrap it up real quick. Yes, and also please provide any additional information that you'd like to the committee. We can do that. Uh, just to say that AB 239 and the... Uh, the idea of having the Committee on Testing for Intoxication study this further and come up with regulations for use and training would address many of the issues that have been raised. Good to know. Thank you for the comment.
conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a nice day, y'all. Okay, we're going to close out the hearing on Senate Bill 447 and go back to our usual practice of blowing through bill hearings. We'll open up the hearing on AB2, which revises provisions relating to public safety. Welcome. Feel free to just get to the meat. Thank you, Madam Chair. Michael, sorry, Michael Hillerby representing the city of Sparks. I think we got the memo, our 15-minute video of rear-facing non-flashing blue lights. Uh, we will not show you tonight. Uh, we'll let Allison McCormick go ahead with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harris and members of the committee. For the record, I'm Allison McCormick, Assistant City Manager for the city of Sparks. Uh, I'm here today to discuss Assembly Bill 2, the result of the city's sole BDR. Current law allows Nevada Department of Transportation and its contractors to use non-flashing blue lights on their vehicles during road maintenance and similar activities. AB2 would add local governments and their contractors to the list of entities that are allowed to use non-flashing blue lights on their vehicles during their own road maintenance activities. Blue light is more visible from further away in certain conditions like snow and nighttime. Uh, if drivers can see local government contractors, uh, or local government vehicles from further away, they can more effectively and more safely take appropriate action such as slowing down or changing lanes to avoid those vehicles. This is especially important for much of the work that local government maintenance crews perform. For example, City of Sparks employees are responsible for maintaining traffic signals at 113 intersections and 734 lane miles of roadways. These essential maintenance activities require city vehicles to move much more slowly than general traffic or to stop altogether in the roadway. Most non-residential streets in Sparks have speed limits of 35 miles per hour and others have speed limits up to 55 miles an hour, making increased visibility from further away especially important. In conclusion, AB2 will allow local government vehicles to use non-flashing blue lights just like NDOT vehicles already can. These lights are more visible, improving safety for local government employees and the traveling public alike. Thank you for your time and consideration of this bill, and Mr. Hillary and I are available to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Committee members, local governments, non-flashing blue lights? Okay, let's open it up for testimony. Thank you. Anyone here in Carson City testify in support of AB2? Grab your seats. Thank you, Chair Harris and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Jennifer Berthium, Government Affairs Manager at the Nevada Association of Counties, or NACO. Um, on behalf of our members, we're in support of AB2 and thank the City of Sparks for this traffic safety enhancement. Nick Sconey, for the record, City of Reno. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. We are in support of this bill. Uh, it supports the safety of our maintenance and operations workers and our Department of Public Works. Thank you. Hello, Ashley Garza-Kennedy representing Clark County. Ditto to everybody else. We are in support of AB2. Thank you. All right. Not seeing anyone in Las Vegas. BPS, can we check the phones, please? You would like to testify in support of AB2. Please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, thank you. Opposition testimony for AB2. No one in Las Vegas. And BPS, can we check the phones? If you would like to testify in opposition to AB2, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right, neutral. Anyone here in Carson City? Still no one in Las Vegas. BPS, uh, pull the line for neutral testimony, please. If you would like to provide testimony in neutral for AB2, please press star 9 to take your place in the queue.
Chair, there are no callers choosing to provide testimony at this time. Okay, unless y'all want to make some closing comments, we'll go ahead and close out the hearing on AB2 and open up the hearing on AB47. Thank you, Chair Harris, Vice Chair Spearman, and members of the Senate Committee on Growth and Infrastructure. For the record, my name is Jennifer Berthume. I serve as the Government Affairs Manager at the Nevada Association of Counties, or NACO. Thank you for the opportunity to present Assembly Bill 47 on behalf of NACO, whose members represent all 17 of Nevada's counties. As you well know, Nevada is home to a variety of outdoor recreation opportunities. In addition to being the home of the first national recreation area, Nevada is also home to the first congressionally de designated off-highway vehicle route, the Silver State OHV Trail, located in Lincoln County. Our members have seen a record number of visitors locally and from across the country looking to take advantage of all our beautiful state has to offer. Counties across the state have been constructing and maintaining various roads, trail, roads and trails designed for OHV usage with a handful of counties creating community-wide trail plans to further attract OHV users. Some of these communities have even organized or sponsored OHV races and events intended to bring individuals from across the country and the globe to Nevada. This bill proposes a new subsection of NRS 490.090. Under section one, this bill would create subsection five which outlines that local government would be allowed to construct, maintain, and operate a trail for use by OHVs that is adjacent to or near a highway, including without limitation a paved highway. As counties make plans for further recreation opportunities, AB 47 seeks to make a clarification in law. There is no intention or desire to impact existing rights of way for paved highways or paved roads in any way. With counties going through a public local ordinance process should they choose to construct, maintain, and operate OHV trails adjacent to or near a paved highway. This completes my presentation of AB 47, and at the pleasure of the chair, I'm happy to take any questions the committee may have. I, okay, um, we'll go with Senator Hansen first. Senator Hansen. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Edgar Flores had a bill that he got it down to nothing. Uh, seems like this is a companion bill to it because he wanted to be able to use OHVs along roadways. Is this related in any way to, to uh, his bills, do you know, bill, do you know? Uh, through you, Chair Harris, to Senator Hansen, Jennifer Berthume for the record. Um, not necessarily, the intent is just to allow um, government entities to be able to create these plans to make these trails adjacent to highways. Okay, no, I thought it might have something to do with it, but it doesn't sound like it does. Thank you. Okay, my question is, what's currently in law that might be construed to prohibit a government entity from constructing, operating, or maintaining a trail? Uh, thank you, Senator Harris, for the question. Jennifer Berthume, for the record. Um, currently, there's no um, clarification in law that this is allowed or not allowed, and I believe that the local government entities would prefer that it be explicit, explicitly allowed. Okay, so maybe this is more of a question for LCB. I don't know if, if you drafted this one, but it doesn't seem that this, and it's not really the most important point, but it doesn't seem that this bill is, is drafted in a way that gives permission. It's drafted in a way that says, oh, it may seem like you can't do this, but let's make sure nothing can be construed to say that you can't. Right, so I mean, we could have just affirmatively had a bill that says a local government may do X, Y, or Z, or you guys could have just did it since there was nothing saying you can't do it, but yet we've got a bill that says nothing shall be construed to prohibit, and that tells me that maybe there's something in the NRS somewhere that might be construed to prohibit. Ideas? Ms. Dummer, did you write this one? <laughs> Uh, this is Jesse Demmer with the LCB Legal Division. Um, as far as I'm aware, uh, there's nothing in the current law that would prohibit a local government from constructing trails on property that they own or otherwise have the right to construct trails on. Um, 
but I, I think your uh, interpretation of the law that it says that it will not be construed to do this is correct. Okay. All right, uh, y'all might have wasted a bill, but it's okay. Senator Spearman. Just real quick, thank you, Madam Chair. I, and, and I looked at it, and it's, it's probably one of those where it doesn't say we can't, doesn't say we can, but in case y'all not here in 10 years and we do it, and the next set of people that are sitting on a dais say y'all shouldn't have done it, then we can point to this, so. Okay. Testimony in support, anyone here testify in support of AB 47? Las Vegas, phones. If you would like to testify in support of AB 47, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. All right, anyone in opposition to AB 47? Carson, Las Vegas, Bones. If you would like to testify in opposition to AB 47, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, neutral testimony. Carson, Vegas, phones. If you would like to provide testimony in neutral for AB 47, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers choosing to testify at this time. Okay, we'll go ahead, and out, go ahead and close out the hearing on AB 47 then and go to public comment. Uh, no one here in Carson, no one in Las Vegas. BPS, is there anyone on the phone who'd like to give us public comment? If you would like to provide public comment, please press star nine to take your place in the queue. Chair, the lines are open and working, but there are no callers choosing to provide comment at this time. All right, thank you. Uh, since we have no other items on our agenda, we will go ahead and adjourn. But before you, we do, members, I just want to let you know we will be having another floor session, and that should be happening shortly. All right, we are adjourned. <laughs>